Hello, everyone, and welcome to Films Across Borders, Stories of Resilience and Hope. I'm Nada Malouf, Chief Advancement Officer in the School of Communication at American University. Through our work here at the School of Communication and presentations such as this, we seek to serve the nation and the world as a teaching, training, and research leader in the fields of communication studies, film and media arts, journalism, and public communication. This is our six year working in partnership with embassy cultural organizations, arts institutions, and environmental groups showcasing films about the major issues of our time. Our focus this year is on the very timely theme of resilience and hope. Now, more than ever, we need stories to inspire and lift us. Thank you to all of our partners for their collaboration this year. You can see them on the screen now. Here's an overview of this year's film series, which you can explore in detail on our website, filmsacrossborders.org. Again, I want to extend our gratitude to our campus co-host, the College of Arts and Sciences, for their partnership. The college's Dean Max Paul Friedman's support has been instrumental to this evening's program, where we will explore the systemic problem of racial tension in America with a discussion of Spike Lee's 1989 seminal drama, Do the Right Thing. AU is committed to be a force of change for racial inequality and equity through education, advocacy, and outreach. Among other initiatives, in 2017, we created the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center to build multidisciplinary initiatives for fostering racial justice, decolonial politics, and intersectional liberation by forging relationships across AU and with exter external change makers in the DC region and beyond. This evening's program is an example of this commitment, and we look forward to the dialogue it will create. As we look back to 1989 with today's lens, we see issues that we still struggle with. In fact, events that spurred Spike Lee to create Do the Right Thing sound eerily familiar. The 1986 incident in Howard Beach where a black man was killed after being chased onto a highway by a mob of white youths as well as the 1984 murder of Eleanor Bumpers at the hands of New York City policemen. Do the Right Thing was released to critical and commercial acclaim and the film received Academy Award nominations for Best Original Screenplay and Best Supporting Actor. It is often listed among the greatest films of all time. And in 1999, the film was deemed culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant by the Library of Congress and was selected for preservation in the National Film Registry. Let's take a look at the trailer now. Ooh, it's gonna be a scorcher. 
Universal Pictures presents a new film from Spike Lee. Good morning, Miss Mother Sister. Now, Mookie, don't work too hard today. The man says it's going to be hot as the devil. I've been here 25 years. LaSalle's famous pizzeria is here to stay. Trust me. Mookie, the last time I trusted you, we ended up with a son. I know you can't stand it. You can't stand it. Hey, hey, Sal, I'm going to burn for the war here. You want brothers on the wall? Love. Get your own place. You can do what you want to do. What I tell you about the noise? What I tell you about the pitch? You called some brother talk to him. You the man. No, you the man. No, you the man. No, you the man. The first time you turn your back, boom. Right here, man, in the back. Y'all take a chill. You like to sign a petition to boycott Tao's famous pizzeria? Hear me, what you ought to do is boycott that no good barber that messed up your head. And that's the double truth. Groove. Fight the power. Fight the power. You know, deep down inside, I think you wish you were black. <laughs> Who told you to step on my sneakers? Who told you to walk on my side of the block? Who told you to be in my neighborhood? I own this brownstone. Who told you to buy a brownstone on my block in my neighborhood on my side of the street? I can't even hear myself think! <laughs> Director of school days, and she's got to have it. Good people, please. If we don't stop this, we can stop it now. We're going to do something, we're going to regret it for the rest of our lives. Doctor, come on, what? What? Always do the right thing. That's it? That's it. I got it. I'm gone. Moderating today's panel is Jeffrey Middens, who studies and teaches film and world literature here in American University's literature department, specifically focusing on Latin American narratives from the 1960s to the present. Additionally, he serves as interim department chair during the 2020-2021 academic year. He is currently working on a book about transnational auteurs working in and out of Hollywood concentrating on Mexican-born director, Alfonso Cuaron. We are so pleased to have Jeff with us here today to moderate this important event, to introduce our panel of speakers, and to learn more about how this event is also supporting the literature department's academic curriculum. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Nada. And uh, thank you once again to uh, all of my colleagues in the uh, American University School of Communication and, Colleges of Art and College of Arts and Sciences uh, for uh, the program of Films Across Borders, a really, really excellent program. It is my great pleasure to introduce my fellow panelists for today. Marisol Negron is an assistant professor with tenure at, of American Studies and director of the Latino Studies program at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where she helped found the Critical Ethnic and Community Studies graduate program. Dr. Negron's research centers on how expressive culture transmits collective memories and social identities across generations of racialized communities. Her book, Made in New Yorico, Salsa as C Cultural Expression and Commodity in New York and Puerto Rico, 1964 to 2014, and under contract currently at Duke University Press, Felicitaciones, uh, recovers aesthetic practices and material conditions within New York's Puerto Rican communities that inform the music's development as a cultural product. She traces how an emerging diasporic Puerto Rican or New Yorican subjectivity embedded within the music privileged New York, the city's Puerto Rican communities and their collective experiences as racialized and colonial subjects, as well as cultural agents. A founding member of the New England Consortium of Latino and Latina Studies, Dr. Negron is also part of a multiracial and multi-ethnic team of Asian American, African, Latino, and Native American and Indigenous Studies scholars contracted by Boston Public Schools to design a series of high school level place-based ethnic studies courses that center on the histories of racialized communities in Boston. Dr. Negron is currently working with an interdisciplinary team of scholars who trace how Puerto Ricans decided to migrate to the United States or remain in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria devastated the archipelago in 2017 
and exacerbated racial, gendered, and geographic inequalities and colonial indifference. Dr. Negron, welcome. And Yava Tufour is a New York and New, New Jersey based multimedia artist with a primary focus on filmmaking. She graduated from American University with a BA in film and media studies and two minors in studio art and business administration. Her previous works include the Emmy awarded news and documentary video, JFK, Building Peace for All Time uh, and award-winning short film, Marvelous. Recently, her work has taken her to television and commercials as a Directors Guild of America trainee. These projects uh, include Law and Order SVU, in un the Untitled Tracy Oliver Project, McDonald's, Dick's Sporting Goods, and TD Bank. Yava's mantra in filmmaking is, without deviation from the norm, progress is not possible. She, is, she encourages others to constantly evolve and de develop their own approach in the craft of filmmaking. Ms. Dufour, welcome. So our plan is to have a discussion today through the many different ways in which we've encountered do the right thing across time, identity formation and experience. Uh, some of you may have watched uh, do the right thing for the first time in the last week or inspired within the last year. Uh, for some of you, it may be 31 years since you first saw the film, uh, since, it has, since it has come out. Um, please feel free to reach out to us through the Q&A button below as we plan to have time uh, to pose questions uh, at, towards as this conversation continues. I wanted to start uh, with our own takes on this. Uh, so both uh, to uh, Marisol and to, to Yava, what are your memories of your first encounters with Do the Right Thing? And what has been your experience? And if you want to continue, uh, what are your experiences upon watching it again now? Uh, Maddie, let's start with you. Okay. So I, uh, that was summer of 89 and I was about to go off to college. And I actually did not go to the movies when I was young. My parents were very conservative. I was not allowed to go to the movies without a chaperone. And so I actually did not see it while it was in theaters. And I actually don't remember seeing it, right? I, I know I saw it, I remember talking about it, but I don't actually remember seeing it. And as I was reflecting on what I knew would be your first question, I thought that, you know, I know it was shown on campus that first semester that you and I were there, but that but first the semester- The disclosure here is that we go back Dr. Negron and I go back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, that first semester in college for me was incredibly tumultuous. I was a first generation Puerto Rican kid from the ghetto, from a poor to working class family, attending this predominantly white, incredibly elite institution. And that semester or that quarter was so traumatic. And so that I wondered, in fact, if that's just part of what has hazed away during that time. So that I remember talking about it and in particular, Rosie Perez's character, right? Uh, we see that four minute crawl at the beginning, but then seeing it again last year, right? Uh, with the re-release was, and with the eyes of someone who having gone to college, I knew my history, uh, growing up in a multiracial, multi-ethnic urban environment in a city about 45 minutes away from New York by train or an hour and a half by train versus now a scholar of Latino studies and being able to place the film in this broader history of black and Puerto Rican relations in New York and the US is a very different experience and still, right, a visually traumatizing experience when we see the murder of Radio Rahim and that it's specifically the chokehold, right, which has been banned in New York City and continues to be used. And so that um, how prescient the film was continues to be part of what I remember. Yaba, you have many years experience difference between when 
we saw this film in 1989. You were not even a thought <laughs> yet yeah. uh, at that point. Um, uh, what is your, uh, some of your first encounters with the film? Well, my, my first few encounters were a bit different because I'm hearing about it first before seeing it. So it's more or less just a cultural reference and I'm not getting it. And so as I'm growing up, I'm seeing Color Purple, then I'm seeing Do the Right Thing, then I'm seeing The Temptations, and you just kind of see a different picture of Black people in film. And specifically with me, my family, uh, I was born in Brooklyn, so we're around that kind of environment. We're very deep into the Black community, very Afrocentric family, very Brooklyn family. So seeing, rewatching it now, it's like, wow, he, he really really captured the neighborhood and really captured the spirit of everything but at the same time it's like we haven't really made much progress it's kind of like a, a, more, a warning to us now and it was made in 89 so it's it's really interesting and fascinating to see how things have changed in some regards and that it's still very much timely and very much relevant uh, were you surprised when you first encountered the film um that a movie from way back in 1989 was still speaking um, uh, to your experiences? I couldn't hear the last oh, part of you, it. Uh, sorry, if, if that a movie uh, all the way back from 1989 was still speaking towards your, uh, your immediate, like literal community growing up in Brooklyn uh, when you did. Yeah, it's, it's really, I don't know, it's, it's nice to see that he's able to really capture the community and capture the relationships between everybody in the community. So when you have uh, Spike Lee's character going around, he's talking to mother sister and she's looking out for everybody on the block and then you have the mayor who's a self-employed, self-determined mayor. It's, it's very much heartwarming to see that because it is a very much a close-knit community and everybody knows each other and it's generational. So you grow up with that and you feel like you're in a safe haven. Mm -hmm. And so it's really figuring out how different parts kind of mesh together within that community, just within Brooklyn or Bed-Stuy or, you know, Crown Heights is just meshing between the two. So it's, it's nice to see that being represented and it's still prevalent now, even though there's more gentrification happening and a lot more people coming into the neighborhood and things changing dramatically. So it's, it's nice to still see that he was able to capture that. Uh, there's a way in which, if we're talking about films across borders, the border that's that's being crossed or not crossed with Do the Right Thing now is time, right? That mm -hmm. we have a, a moment, I mean, there is a way, uh, Mari, you, you and I can both talk about, to some extent about how this is 1989. This is really, I mean, the music is very, Public Enemy becomes a thing in 1989, and there's a way in which the movie is of the moment, and yet it's not, right? That there's a way in which, and, and is it that this movie, you know, steadfastly stays with us uh, across time? Is there something about the movie? Is there something? You know, it seems, it feels, I would say, I think that it is, that it captures a moment in time and a, his, a, a historical moment in time that itself is crosses time, right? Rather than the film itself. You know, it is the late 1980s. New York is rapidly changing demographically during this time, right? So that one of the reasons that Spike Lee is invested in showing relationships between Black and Puerto Rican communities in New York and Black broadly defined actually, right? So that we're talking, if you remember one of the early uh, shots in the film is of the Ameri on, a, on a wall, it's the mural, the outside of a building and there's a US flag on either side. And then you have the Jamaican flag, the Puerto Rican flag and the UNIA flag, the Pan-African flag, and then with pictures of folks underneath that, is that these are communities that were coming into Brooklyn at, you know, during similar time periods in the post-World War II period, right? 
that we have the great migration from the South, the second great migration from the South. You have what is called among Puerto Ricans, the great migration as well to New York. Excuse me. And you also have West Indian communities, right, coming into the space. And for Puerto Rican communities, in fact, they had been in Brooklyn since the early 1920s. And it was one of the first colonias established in Brooklyn by Puerto or among Puerto Ricans established in New York. But by the late 1980s, what we know by 1990, in fact, is that there is an increasing number of Central Americans in New York City, an increasing number of Mexicans in New York City. Um, and so that it captures this moment when we can think about New York as Black and Puerto Rican, even ignoring Dominicanness, right? Because it's not, he really speaks to Puerto Ricanness. But, you know, it does capture the sense of a historical moment when New York is going through, continuing to go through enormous economic transformation as well, so that we are seeing the ramifications of, you know, the, the what was it called now? It's the, the term is exp, uh, planned shrinkage in New York City during this time, so that when we're looking at these empty lots and rundown buildings, what we're seeing are the ramifications of planned shrinkage, lack of tuberculosis testing, Etc. So that while the themes, unfortunately, right, continue to resonate today, it does simultaneously capture this particular historical moment and the possibilities and tensions between West Indian, US African American, and Puerto Rican communities, and of course, Italians who were the ones who left for the suburbs in the 1950s. Right, and so that the continuation of those historical tensions. There are some interesting tensions um, uh, when you're talking particularly about the, the different communities, the West Indian communities coming in with uh, the three on the corner, ML, Sweet Dick Willie, and um, oh, I'm forgetting the third character's name right now. Um, but they, they mention among other things uh, when they're berating uh, uh, or, or uh, lamenting what's happening with the Korean grocer on the corner. And then mm -hmm. saying, you know, you just got off the boat yourself. You know, why are you, what are you complaining about with, with all of this? Um, uh, there is a way, uh, so I, 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 I fully am with you that this is like almost a trapped in amber moment. Uh, there is, uh, this is a, such a hypothetical, it's, it's almost not worth considering and yet I'm gonna ask this. Um, uh, could you, the changes that you mentioned, you know, reflect a different New York City you couldn't do a do the right thing now, right? In, in this do the right thing would have to be a very, and I'll, I'll, uh, the, re the reason for this that I'm thinking about this, oh, Yaba, maybe you wanna take that, take that on? No, I, I want you to further elaborate. I'm just curious to see what so, you mean specifically. Well, by now. I'm thinking of another movie that comes out in the in the mid in the mid '90s. Um, and sorry for bringing another uh, movie into this mix that maybe you're unfamiliar with, uh, but uh, the French movie La Haine, um, uh, which is seen as this, uh, also seen as an as a as a Parisian version of Do the Right Thing. Um, but there are three friends there who are working together with uh, one, one, of the, one of the teenagers is Jewish, one of them is uh, Arabic, and one of them is of African, all, all immigrants into the, into the Banlui. And uh, there is a way in which their resistance against everyone else uh, and it's, it is a very, it is very reminiscent of Do the Right Thing in that it's, it's you know, sort of this contained violence. Um, the, uh, there is a way that the director himself has said that this is now almost seen as um, a utopia because those three communities don't speak to one another anymore. The idea that these three, three communities, that three members of these separate communities would be friends 25, 30 years later is almost impossible. And there is a, the, this is one of the, the reasons, one of the reasons I'm, I'm thinking about this, Mari, with your uh, uh, explanation about what's happened with New York, that there's a moment here within the black and the Puerto Rican communities in particular that's reflected in the film. 
the film would have to go much broader now, right? If we were to do this. Yeah, yeah well, I agree. I do, I do agree it would have to be much broader just because the, the landscape of Brooklyn now has changed so much that if you were to tell it now, you'd have a wide scope of uh, racial demographics. And so that would really change the dynamics between people and you wouldn't have as much racial tension between people. And I feel like, I, I don't know how, it, it wouldn't be the same do the right thing. Thus you wouldn't get the same kind of reaction and it wouldn't be as timely. It would kind of just be representative of the now. And I don't think it would be as, as, as a longevity as do the right thing is now. You know, I actually would say that on the one hand, it would have to be different, but that it could still happen, right? That one of the things about that Spike Lee does in this film, uh, despite the challenges of the film, right, that we can talk about, is that it's a very place-based film, right? And it's one block mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, in, in a, a one block in a neighborhood in Brooklyn, in New York. Mm -hmm. And so that that yeah. kind of story can be told and in fact would allow for a the specificity of relationships within broader context because what often gets lost now is that specificity. So that, for example, we don't talk about Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and, you know, Mexicanos, go, travel, you know, migrating to New York. We talk about Latinos, right? And that part of what the film does is it's part of its power lies in the specificity of space and the specificity of relationships. So that in that regard, I do think do the right thing. It would be a different film. Right. Yeah. Um, but it would be one, for example, wherein, you know, relationships between, I think I would argue still, you can have a film about relationships between Black diasporic communities mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. as Asian American communities. Because one of the things that happens, right, and do the right thing after the violence is that moment of, is will there be violence enacted toward the Korean grocers or not. And in yeah. that moment, all of the tensions that we see among black residents and with Korean, the Korean grocers dissipates, right? As yeah. they find commonality as racial subjects against police who is, uh, one of whom is white and one of whom is not, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because Miguel Sandoval plays the second policeman, Yep. Mm -hmm. right? So that, that is also a signifying of Puerto Ricanness within the police as well, right? And the ways in which the experiences of Black and non-Black Puerto Ricans in New York is very different, particularly when we mm. think about racial profiling, right? And stop and frisk practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A quick note before we go on, if uh, folks are wanting to direct questions, direct them to the Q&A button and not the chat button um, uh, within, uh, if you'd like to, to pose questions to us. Um, uh, let's talk about that sense of place. Let's talk about that block uh, This, this, and what this block is in. I was talking very recently about this, about how uh, it's both because you are so right, Mari, that this is very much a, based in this block. Like, and there's it's 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 almost like a a, a box where all of uh, all of the community is contained within, and yet it gets penetrated by various different other uh, people that come in. Um, there's an interesting way to view modes of transportation here: uh, the different cars mm -hmm. that come in. Of uh, the police vehicles, uh, the law enforcement vehicles, but also um, uh, even the uh, the oh gosh uh, the raspadilla, uh, the, the ice cream truck. The, 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 yeah. yeah, we call it raspadilla, and so I'm forgetting. What, but this, the, those are are like in, in, there. There are people that come into the block, and they almost need to have some form of transportation into this block, and then out of the block as well. There's a way in which the block is both a place where people stay and a place where people go through. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. 
I just wanted to talk about the block, like in terms of let's let's uh, let, let's contemplate this this space and how how Lee really like crafts this space. Yeah, I think this space is a character of its own because it kind of forms everybody together and it kind of influences the relationships and influences their action, like you were saying. So it's like you see um, Mars and his sister living in an apartment and it's mother sister's apartment. And so when it burns up, it's like, that's, that's everything that she knew. So it's like her, the process of the block changing so dramatically is traumatic to everybody. And it's not even the, the killing at the end. It's just the fact that everything around them is burning. So it's, I would like to see like what would happen the next day. Cause it seems like Mars continues to live whatever life he is, but I want to know well, how exactly does he move? Cause he just lost his house. So how, how is he operating now? And what would that continuation be if he had to leave the block and go somewhere else? Mm -hmm. You know, and that, um, you know, when you look at it, you know, what Spike Lee shows in focusing on that singular block are the dense community relationships that exist at the block level, right? Or several blocks together within New York City and the ways in which these are relationships that have developed over decades mm -hmm. in those spaces mm -hmm. at a moment when those relationships are being threatened, right? They're being, they have been, right? We're talking a moment, you know, post civil rights movement, you know, entrance of neoliberal economic policies of the 1970s. And that one of the things that happens on this block that we see Mookie doing, right, is that a lot of these relationships are in fact um, framed within the market, right? And so yeah. that all the relationships are about capital. And mm -hmm. so that Sal can put whatever pictures he wants because he owns it. Right. Mm. Um, Giancarlo Esposito's character says, yeah, but we are the people who eat here. Right. And so that that identity is based on as a consumer. Likewise, mm. Sal, you know, gives money to Smiley to get him away from his extremely violent prone son. Right. And so that it is always money that is in some way framing these relationships, even the Korean grocers. Right, because power is framed in terms of financial capital and in terms of property. And that one of the things that's interesting about Mookie is the way that he, re he resists that, right? And so that he really resists what we would call um, productive time, right? Yeah. Deliver the pizza, get yeah. back here, get another one, deliver one. And he's like, yeah, you know, it's hot, it's six floors, I'm gonna take my time, you're doing just fine, right? At the end yeah. of the day, Sal oh. says, we had a good day, <laughs> right? So that Mookie really resists that kind of productive time at a time when African-American employment continues to be twice of what it is for whites. Well, it's also, although, you know, because I agree with you that Mookie is resisting this. And at the same time, what do you got to do? I got to go out there and make that money. Yes. And he says that mm -hmm. over and over. And that's that's an interesting conflict as well. But he but he doesn't do it right within. The, he resists this framework of wage labor. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and at a moment when New York City and the country right are going through multiple recessions. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. that we have the New York recession that hits and then the US economic recession hits, and then we're in the middle of the, you know, we're at the end of the 1980s with the disastrous economic effects um, of a trickle down economic theory of uh, welfare reform that is coming down the pike. The movie, everything is framed in one's identity as a consumer because Giancarlo Esposito's identity is in part based on sneakers and how much they cost, right? So that while it is an absurd scene almost, right? The mm -hmm. scene where he's complaining to the white guy in the Celtics jersey in the 1980s, right? In the Celtics jersey in New York City. Which means something very significant then also. And still does, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what it really is about is about respect. Right. And this mm -hmm. white body, this white male body 
moving through this space and not even noticing that they pushed another black body and that it is a male space that even though there are some women within these spaces those who assert authority via the public space are all men and they are all cis men right um so i'm we're going to get back to a couple of those those topics in just a moment i've got a question that's come in which is interesting it's specific uh for you yaba in terms of um in terms of this block also we can talk about how this block gets specifically created in the aesthetics that are yeah. set up for this film um uh, there's a question uh, in terms of, do you, can you talk a little bit about the film, the film's aesthetics as a filmmaker in terms of, since you are a filmmaker, as uh, iconic, do you, is this, how is this iconic and how has the film uh, impacted you as a filmmaker specifically? Oh, it's, it's kind of been the foundation of my experience as a filmmaker because there's not too many uh, well-known prominent black filmmakers, especially because Spike is an independent filmmaker. So that's, he's just stacking on different rarities. And so it's, it's iconic in the fact that everything that everybody's wearing, the colors, the outfits, the patterns that they wear, it pops. Like that is Brooklyn all the way. And like um, the fire hose, when they spray the fire hose and you see everybody playing and you pick people up and you throw them in. There's just like, those moments are very like, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's just like memories. Like you, you're instantly transported there. So it's just like the mother, sister staying on the stoop, watching everybody, telling everybody's business. Like every, every inch of that film is just iconic because it's so, it, it's just Brooklyn. Is there a particular <laughs> visual moment for you that stands out um, in the film? I mean, there's so many. Uh, <laughs> there are so many. I would say the fire hose is is the most iconic because it's it's just the best time because you know when it's hot and someone's able to bust the cap off and it just sprays everywhere it's fun it's just pure fun mm -hmm. and so it's funny when the guy comes over in his cadillac it's like you're not gonna come come in and like ruin our fun like we're purely enjoying ourselves on our block on our street with our people like there's no way you're gonna stop that so it's that moment right there yeah Why no, I, go ahead Oh, no, no, well, go I was ahead. Gonna, uh, you know, spring off of what you were saying, Yaba, that that fire hydrant scene for me is, is really iconic. So I grew up in a poor and working class, Puerto Rican neighborhood, some Black families as well, um, some yeah. white families. And, you know, the, the fire hydrant was a source of freedom in the summer, you know, right? I yeah. mean, it is, I mean, part of what is, uh, the set, the heat is a character, right? The heat is a character. And water in the film is about possibility and freedom, right? We see Jade, right, in the shower. We see Tina putting her head in the ice water. Um, the beer, right? Which when we could argue they were drinking mm -hmm. Miller. So, you know, it was a little bit of water down. It was a little bit of beer with water, right? And, um, but that water, right, is a site of possibility in a way that like music, right? Music and water are, 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 are characters or embody some kind of possibility and freedom and, and within the film. And so when he smashes Radio Rahim's, you know, box, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's incredibly symbolic of the role of music because if we think about it, um, Smiley stutters, right? Yeah. Um, the mayor is, you know, always, always has a drink in his hand, but so that there is something that always diminishes, right? The narrative, those who are trying to speak some truth in particular, yeah. right? Including Radio Rahim, right? He's often silent, but it's music mm -hmm. that speaks. Right, it's Samuel Jackson's right. DJ Lovely, am I remembering that right? Mr. Senior yeah. Love Daddy. Mr. Senior Love Daddy. Uh, <laughs> but that music and water are beyond language in that right, beyond the, the the written word that the music embodies some possibility. Right, it's fight the power, because one of the things that happens yeah. in the film is that 
they fight Sal, but ultimately that scene is of a rendering of power in front of the police, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And you see that throughout. I think if you if you take that same idea, it's like um, they're all trying to find an equality along each other in some weird way. Like I think the scene with uh, Radio Rahim and he's having that music battle uh, with the guys on the porch with their Latin music and his hip hop music. And at the end of it, they gave him respect because they're like, man, you, you got it. Like you got it. So it's, it's finding that equality among all that muck that's really interesting. And even the tensions, right? Because one of the things that happens is that you, you, Lee does not romanticize the relationship between Puerto Ricans and West Indian and US African-American communities in the film. In fact, it's quite, yeah. I would say that he not only doesn't romanticize it, but there are some real problems in the way that he represents it. Because if you see Tina and Jade, if you see the, the presumably Puerto Rican guys on the stoop, um, you know, he cast Puerto Ricans as always lighter skinned than yeah. quote, black characters, right? And that yeah. we see it also in Tina versus Jade. So Tina's lighter skinned, she has straight hair, right? Uh, Jade, mm -hmm. darker skin, she has natural hair. Jade actually has, we see her outside, right? We never, yeah. Tina was always circumscribed, right? And then these Puerto Rican men are, all of them are lighter skinned than most every other quote black character in the film. And so that there's a way in which it reflects these questions of what is black in the United States mm -hmm. and how is Latinidad seen in some ways, right? As among Latinos and non-Latinos as quote, not quite black, right? And so that at the same time, he was putting um, African-Americans and Puerto Ricans as part of a black diaspora. So it's, a, it's not an easy, yeah. and that, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a quite complex and, and um, representation to talk about. There's a, there's an interesting way, of course, in which the title and the title scene, you know, come with that, you know, uh, doctor always do the right thing. And that statement by itself mm -hmm. is so complex in the idea of, of, of that there are so many right things um, that are, that are, that are yeah. working within there. And there's a way in which I, I love this movie for the way in which it, it doesn't offer an easy answer to uh, doing the right thing. It does offer an easy answer to what is the wrong thing, but not mm. uh, that, that what he proposes, you know, that, 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 that conflict, that tension is still part of this and still part of, of this community. That doesn't go away. You know, Yaba, your question from before, what happens the next day? You know, it's, yeah. it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, and a lot of it is still going to be the same. You know, you still have yeah. the street. You still have, you know, all of these things that are happening uh, with this uh, uh, with this community. Um, uh, let's. Uh, I've got a couple other questions uh, out there. Um, uh, there is a question about uh, for for this group of artists, storytellers, activists. Um, what is the role of art? What is the role of a movie like this can play in change making? Um, uh, how can this uh, how can can art? Uh, uh, how can you use art? Well, I mean, how has this this film been used in a way to change? Mm. Yeah, but would you? Um, yeah. Well, I think it's just by starting conversation. Every every film I know personally that I make or every project I get into, I always ask, "What's the point of it?" You know. What's, what are we trying to get out of it? If we're just trying to go to festivals, then it just needs to look pretty. But if we're trying to like, like get a message across and like, you know, tell our piece, then we need to like really emphasize story and emphasize character and like, you know, find a way to massage in our messages because Spike Lee is not subtle. He's very direct in the conversations. Like every dialogue is him speaking to us. He's telling us, he's arguing against the, the counterpoint. So he's not subtle whatsoever in that. So I think for him, each film he makes is a message and everything that he does within it, he's sending a message. 
And if you look and do the right thing, I think he talked about global warming at one point. Mm-hmm. And he talked about the racial tensions and he, he talks about so much stuff if you look deep into it. So I think it's that that's the whole point. You want to start dialogue, you want to start conversation and you want to have good character so people can walk through another person's shoes. And, you know, along with that, that, you know, I would argue, right, that he both animates these discussions, but also reinforces other problems, right? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, when we were talking about the panel earlier today, we talked about the representation of female characters. Yes, I'm so glad we're getting there, yes. Yeah, I mean, so that, you know, what's interesting to me is, is less how does he represent them than why they have why they function this way within the film and the yeah. ways in which women circumscribe possibility for him right they make his world they they threaten yeah. to make his world smaller mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. whether it's his sister whether it is uh whether it's tina right these women except for the asexual mother sister right that these mm-hmm. Women um, are in, some, in in many ways a threat to him and his um, performance of freedom and freedom through the performance of normative masculinity, and that yeah. right that is a problem. At the same time, it is a film that allows these conversations to happen. But you know, one of the questions that came out right when it initially oh it's going to create have black people riot in the united states and you know the way the media attempted to frame that narrative within mainstream sources um it's a film that you get out part of what you're bringing in in your own positionality Right. So that part, I feel that part of my understanding of the film and how I read the film and its significance to me comes through my understanding of race and racism in the United States, police brutality against Black people in the United States. Because, you know, I was reading, I went back to read some stuff and I was reading a piece from last year in the Atlantic and they talked about how there was no right, there was only wrong, how everybody had a point. And I thought, See, when I come into this with an understanding of the history of how police were created, right, in the context of slavery and the circumscribing of Black freedom, to me, there's a very clear right. There may be shades of, well, this or that, but this idea that the violence is wrong that the Atlantic piece was talking about, I said, well, there is a lack of understanding about how violence develops within racialized communities that is very pertinent to the current moment, right? That violence cannot be the answer, yeah. right? And so for me, yeah. I think a lot of people read through it what they were putting in, right? Because meaning is created in between the viewer and the film, right? And so that the plurality of meanings is a real challenge with this film as well. This is, I mean, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, we brought, like, like why we started this, that, you know, our own positionality coming into this film definitely, I think, affects our, our reading of, of this, that this is, uh, that, that we need to be, uh, we need to be cognizant of our own position coming in coming yeah. in watching this film. Um, there is a question that just came out which actually you know relates to this to some extent. Uh, can do the right thing simultaneously be specific and widely relatable specifically specifically to a white audience? And how do those facets Ooh. of the film intersect? And it's it's an interesting question, Ooh. I think, because there is, you know, there is a way in which and I don't know how much this was so in, you know, Maria and I, we need to go back to our memories of this, how much this was marketed to a quote unquote mainstream audience in 1989. And yet there was no other audience in some ways uh, for Warner, for Universal to actually release yeah. this to. But part of this question, right, 
forces us to ask the question, why are, why do we question the universality of Black stories? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't question yeah. the universality of stories that feature white characters with the perspectives of white characters. We only question movies, films, literature that comes from the perspective of vulnerable communities. Mm -hmm. Right. How yeah. are these stories not universal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It is. Both How is this not the quintessential American story? Because and how is it right? How does it not speak to questions of settler colonialism? Yeah. How does it not speak to questions of gentrification? How does it not speak to questions of class and gender and race? It the universal exists through the specific mm -hmm. in yeah. this regard. It is the specificity of the film, right, that gives it meaning. Mm -hmm. rather than some kind of, I, I, I'm not even going to use the word universal, right? But this idea that the lives and stories of African-American, Jamaican, and Puerto Rican people on one block are not somehow part of broader narratives mm -hmm. is deeply troubling. Yeah. I think it's also about, in some regards, I can understand because I, you know, I was born in Brooklyn. I was raised there for a bit, and then I moved to Indiana, which is very homogeneous. Like I, I would say I was the only black person in like three of my classes. And so telling them my stories and like my experiences of Brooklyn, it just went over their heads because they don't have that same reference. Like they don't have that same reference with the water hose. They don't have that same reference of like going to a bodega. They don't have the same reference as having that one pizza spot that everybody goes to. So I can understand if they can't you know, if it doesn't hit them in the same way, but it is also tell asking you just to sit back and watch and accept what you see and then make your mm -hmm. your conclusions afterwards after you've been provided what information that you that you can get. So it's I don't know. I don't it's that's a really good question and interesting and I would love to have a conversation with someone who doesn't have that same reference who kind of lived maybe in the suburbs with like homogeneous racial people and stuff like that because it is it does require some give and take and some references. And well, there's I a way I'll, I'll throw out my own positionality in this. This is, you know, something that we we came in in, in with this. When I saw the movie in, in 1989, I'm an American citizen, but I actually was living overseas. Uh, when mm -hmm. uh, I came to college from living in South America, where there, this is was an entirely new perspective uh, for me. Um, even when I was living in the United States, it was, uh, it, it was very much a, um, uh, it was a suburban, you know, I was the only Latin American kid, you know, in suburban New York, but that was, you know, there was sort of, sort of like, it wasn't even a question then. There was not even, because I look like this, there was not even a question, you know, about what, I was Italian or Jewish. I was never, you know, <laughs> else. Peruvian was not even in the question there. Moving to Peru, that became a completely different, di different uh, uh, reality. But then coming back and experiencing this movie that actually then narrowed in on this, uh, this, this experience, it is a, a very different experience and eye opening and like, oh, this is, this is, this is what this is. This is a story. This is the story. I also wonder, given uh, the, you know, one of the legacies of Do the Right Thing is that this is not the only story anymore, that we in fact yeah. have insisted upon other stories uh, uh, being brought into the mix so that, you know, um, Mighty, I don't know if you teach, do you teach American, like that, that American lit is like, or American uh, popular culture is so, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot going on, right? Yeah, there's a lot going on. And, and it, you know, it goes back to really this question of universality. Yeah. So that students walk into a class that is heavy on, say, the Latino or Black popular culture, suddenly they're like, I didn't know this was a Black studies class, or I didn't know this was a, and these are things that we get, you know, I've gotten things like, you know, comments on the Puerto Ricanness of a class in my reviews, right? So these are very real comments that students give. But I would say that in terms of what we see now, right, is that now, you know, we have um, Julie Dash, yeah, mm -hmm. right? 
and Daughters of the Dust. And we have Ava DuVernay, right? And the yeah. films and documentaries that she has contributed, right? And the difference that they're yeah. making, mm -hmm. right? When you think yeah. about the, the Central Park case, right? Mm -hmm. And the ways that she, you know, trans transcends whatever boundaries you want to put around what is quote black filmmaking right because yeah. she's also done sci-fi and these and you know you talk about aesthetically just heart pounding be achingly beautiful film mm -hmm. right um a wrinkle in time um mm -hmm. that in a way, yeah, but I wonder what you think. It, it, I wonder, because I'm thinking about what is tomorrow. And in some ways, the tomorrow of do the right thing is this moment now, I would say. That the tomorrow and, and you know, the hope and the fear and possibility is this moment of Black Lives Matter. And for Latino communities, in fact, right, the continuing challenging of anti-Black racism in Latino communities, that it is not Latinos support Black Lives Matter. No, because that suggests, right, it makes invisible Black Latinidad. But that to me, in yeah, some yeah. ways, being almost 50 and seeing NASCAR say you cannot have the Confederate flag in the stands anymore, to see yeah the WNBA and the NBA and MLB be leaders in saying we're walking yeah. off the job today mm -hmm. um, is, is part of the tomorrow over the last 30 years. So, yeah. so to come back to the, the other question that we had, what does art do next? Yeah, but you're the artist in the room, so. <laughs> I mean, um, what does art do next? That's a, I mean, it's, it depends on the artist really, but um, I don't, I don't know. I feel like it does push people because I feel like the whole, the reason why I love film is because it does change the world in like a dramatically dramatic way of saying it. It changes the world because it allows people to look into a new life, a new world, put themselves into different situations maybe that they've been in and see how different people reacted to it. And it encourages and it motivates people to do something different because not everybody likes to, you know, have a stagnant life and not to see the same repeat over and over and over again. So they want that difference. They want that difference so much that it motivates them to literally get up and do something. And I think when art is that good, that's, that's amazing that it makes you literally get up and do something. And the it just speaks more to the film as well because if it's been what, nearly 11 years about when it was released that- um, The right thing? A, a few, yeah, is that oh, right? No, is my math 31. 31 years. <laughs> I'm not a math major, I wasn't a math major, <laughs> but 31 years and it's, it is, if this is the tomorrow of do the right thing, then it motivated people so much to make them want to do up and get up and do something, do the right thing. And like, I remember seeing when um, George Floyd happened, they did show that part of um, uh, the guy getting murdered and they were like, this is the exact same thing. So it just constantly adds fuel to the fire and it motivates people. There is, um, uh, if, if folks are not familiar with this, there, Spike Lee has actually edited footage of uh, what happens to Radio Rahim with um, what happens to Eric Garner and George Floyd um, in very, very powerful um, uh, videos that he's put up uh, on Twitter. Um, uh, at the same time, of course, Spike Lee this weekend has a new film. Uh, called <laughs> American Utopia, uh, which is a David Byrne concert film uh, in, in and of itself. Um, we're almost out of time. I wanted to, to sort of loop back around and to some extent, Yaba, I think you've already answered this, you know, this, the, the, the series is looking at, you know, stories of hope and resilience. Um, and there's a way in which uh, this, this film really takes us to like an, an, another another place, another time, but really then sends us forward. I, I really love the way Mario says that, the, saying that the, uh, the, tomorrow, the tomorrow of do the right thing is now uh, as mm -hmm. to 
what is what is actually happening what are the, what is hoped that's actually brought about through do the right thing because i think i think we can say this Mari. in 1989 i don't think we could have we we want we we could dream of this but this was not you know going to happen tomorrow in 1989 in 1989 i mean part of the film is that you know so a lot of the scenes right like you were saying yeah about early that you know it's very didactic right and so that part of what we're seeing are archetypes throughout the film of different char- of different people turned into characters and but one of the things that is let's say as real with real right in quotation marks is the murder of radio rahim that without the internet, without social media, the widespread violence against black communities is something to which, unless you experienced it, saw it, were part of that, know that history, you may have known it, but you didn't know it. And that what we see now is that Eric Garner and George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, right? And the names go on and on and on that that was not an archetype, right? That was not symbolic, that part of it, right? That he can very easily intersperse those is incredibly painful. And that, you know, while on the one hand, if if the present, if the day after is in part now, right? We've, it has led us here is that it's not all hope and resilience, unfortunately, right? That we are living through what so many have called a double pandemic, right? COVID-19 and the pandemic of anti-Black racism in this country that is an ongoing one. And so that, and even as, you know, while Black Lives Matter may once again be falling out of the media, right? I mean, Black Lives Matter is how old now? Seven, eight years old, right? It kept going when the media was no longer looking. Mm -hmm. Um, It is both, right? So that it is both abject violence and hope through resistance. Um, And a moment in which once again, you know, as one of the Q and A, someone put in the Q and A section, right? The destruction of property is seen more transgressive than the murder of black men and women, including tr- black trans men and women, right? Yeah. Uh, specific, especially trans um, women. That is still the case, right? That is still part of the discussion that's happening, and one of the reasons that the film remains. Um, so rooted to the present. Mm-hmm. Well, and how important this movie still is to the present, right? That there is there is a way in which there is, <clears throat> what hope and resilience there is, 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 maybe that we can still go, we can still learn, we can still learn from this, we still have more to learn from this. Um, and that there are ways in which we can we can take this movie and still bring it through the present and through this through the the, the issues of the double pandemic that you're talking about um, and 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 bring it out there. I we I realize we are slightly over time here, um, and uh, so we are going to wrap this up. Um, uh, Yava Tufour and Marisol Negron. You guys are amazing. You guys are awesome. Um, uh, I think we could go for, I, in fact, you know, if they let us stay on this Zoom call, we may keep going on <laughs> about this. Um, <laughs> I would love that too. <laughs> Part two. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us today um, uh, for this conversation. Um, thanks once again to the folks at Films Across Borders um, and everyone at the School of Communication and uh, the College of Arts and, and Sciences. I hope, uh, as with uh, most of whatever my film classes, that this is only the start of a conversation. Do the Right Thing is an amazing uh, text to actually start a real conversation, um, uh, even in your own homes, uh, but also with others. Um, uh, share it. I hope that you'll share our conversations 
I will say the Department of Literature next week is having an entire colloquium where we're going to spend an entire day talking about this text uh, as well. So I'll plug that in, um, uh, look on social medias uh, for the AU's Department of Literature's uh, event on this where students, faculty, and alumni will be talking about this film uh, and doing all sorts of presentations. Yava, Mari, thank you so, so much uh, for coming today. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.